Oh, there you go. That's way better. You can tell as soon as you nudge the gas, you can tell if it's right or not. Yeah, it's way better. I can already see the comments on this video, and there's going to be two overriding themes. One is going to be like, I've been a mechanic for 40, 50, 60 years, and that's how I've always done it, and that's the best way to do it. And then there's going to be another school that's going to be like, I just went out and tried this on my car, and I cannot believe how good it runs. Thank you, you're a genius, blah, 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 blah. This is a difficult video to do, but it's a really effective video. Now, why is it a difficult video to do? It's hard because I'm going to try to explain an intuitive process that is really more about uh, sense, your sense of hearing, your, you know, your feel for things, and so on and so forth, that that it's, it's, it's honed over years of messing around with this. But the basics apply. And these basics apply to any internal combustion engine that uses a distributor to set timing, right? Or, or to control timing, I should say. Now, in the past, we've done videos on timing. We've done several videos on timing because it's one of the key elements, it's one of the key factors to efficient performance or maximum performance. So we've already done videos on setting total timing. We've done videos on setting ignition curves. We've done videos on checking marks, on how to make sure everything is exactly where it's supposed to be. So we've already covered all of the high-end timing things on this channel. And those generally apply to race cars, hot rods, engines that are fresh, uh, where everything is just right and those things apply. But when you're talking about an engine that has some service life to it, something that's been on the road, it's got 100,000, 150, 200, 300,000 miles on it, those methods don't work effectively. Uh, and we're talking about ignition time, we're talking about setting your ignition timing. So when you're dealing with a fresh, good engine, the timing light is really the only way to go. It's the only way you're going to get an accurate representation of what's going on. And again, with a high performance motor, you're more concerned with total timing than you are with initial timing and the curve. But when you're talking about, like I said, an engine that's got 150, 200,000 miles on it, this thing is of very little use. This is good to get your initial timing set, but as far as making the car run to its optimum, it's, it's not going to do any good, and I'll explain why. So, you've got an older engine, a couple hundred thousand miles on it, unknown history, right? You've never been inside of it. You don't know what's going on there. It's just typical. It hasn't been opened up during the course of its life. And the perfect example of this is that small block Chevy that's in John's caddy that we did the video on the other day. And there was one scene where I pulled into, we pulled into the gas station, and I jumped under the hood, and I grabbed the distributor, and gave it a tug, and we went back out again, and he says, yeah, runs much better. And you could hear, you could feel the way the car responded to the throttle. Did I know where the timing was as far as the marks go if I put a timing? No idea whatsoever. What I was doing was power timing it. And I, I've been doing this for so long that I've been, I don't even have to drive it to power time it. I can tell by the tone of the engine's exhaust. I can tell by how it responds to throttle. And if it pings under load, if I hear an audible ping under load, We'll get to that in a minute. So I've been doing this for so long that I really don't have to pay much attention to it. It just comes, it's a second nature to me. And it, when I was a kid, it was actually like my ace in the hole. I was like 16 years old when I became a mechanic. So most of the cars that I were, almost all of the cars that I were working on, at that point was from the, uh, the, the 60s and the early 70s. They all had vacuum advance and mechanical advanced distributors. Uh, and the wisdom of the day was put a timing light on it and set it to the marks that are in the book. So if the book calls for four degrees before top dead center, that's, well, it, that's where you set it. But when I was 16, I didn't have a timing light. <laughs> so I used to do everything by the seat of my pants. And people would bring me their cars, and I'd give it a tune-up, and I would... It, now, I had read someplace in, in one of the magazines, Hot Rod Carcraft, whatever it was, about advancing timing and how uh, ignition timing was set 
from the factory for emissions purposes and for, uh, for, for you know, smooth drivability and so on and so forth. And that, you know, to advance the timing a little bit. So what I would do is when I would do a tune-up for a customer, change the plugs, cap, rotor, points, condenser, I would take the distributor and give it just a little pull in the direction of, you know, to advance it. Give the car back to them and if they would, that my car never ran so good, that's amazing, what'd you do to this thing, you're a magician? And I, you know, I really don't know what I did. Remember, I'm a 16-year-old kid. You know, I know, I know it's making a difference, but I don't know exactly how or why it's making a difference. But it, it, it made me like, you know, a, a star mechanic as a kid. And again, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just flying by the seat of my pants. But I was power timing. And this is a process, like I said, after years and years and years of doing this, it's almost a, it, it's, it's almost a psychic, intuitive process. But I'm going to show you how to do it. And I'm going to explain why you do it this way. So you go back to our fresh motor and we're going to set it by the timing light. We're going to set it to the timing marks. And those timing marks, as I said, the timing marks are set by the factory for emissions purposes. They're set given that the car is going to use X, you know, whatever type of gas is going down, you know, you're going to come across down the road, different altitudes and everything. So the ignition timing is, as, as, um, uh, as outlined by the manufacturer and the curve, the ignition curve, as outlined by the manufacturer, is all for that general usage. And it's all predicated on the engine being fresh. Now as an engine goes through its life, things change. Like for instance, timing, the timing chain, the timing chain will stretch a little bit, the gears will wear down a little bit, the timing will actually become retarded, the cam timing will become retarded. That hurts bottom end power. That hurts that, you know, that initial hit. Now, in addition to retarding the camshaft, let's say one or two degrees because of the stretch here, it's also retarding the distributor. So to compensate for that, you want to, as the engine ages, you want to advance it just a little bit. This is, of course, the best way is to pull the motor apart and replace everything fresh, but that's not realistic in most cases. In most cases, you have an original engine, it runs okay, it's not bellowing smoke or anything like that, and you just want to make it run as best as you can. Compression ratio changes, the compression ratio drops, your dynamic compression ratio. Your static compression ratio never changes because that's, that's just a, a group of measurements. But the dynamic compression ratio, which includes uh, things like cam timing, it includes valve seal, it includes ring seal, that does change. And over an engine's life, it diminishes. And again, once with the lower compression, the engine needs more ignition timing. So basically, and that, that was a perfect example, John's car, John's caddy, when we took it for that initial ride, I told him, I said, it's running on seven cylinders. And as we were driving along, you could feel it. I, it, was, it was very pronounced. It wasn't a dead miss. It was an, un, an unevenness right on the edge of being a dead miss. But after I gave it that little tweak with the distributor to advance it, it went away. Why is that? Because one of the cylinders of that engine its dynamic compression ratio had dropped to the point that the ignition timing wasn't sufficient to get good power out of that cylinder. So it was just kind of like going through the motions. When I advanced the timing, you know, gave it that little, that little tweak there, that was enough to bring that cylinder back to life. So after we gave it that little tweak, the motor smoothed out completely. So how do you go about power timing an engine, because that's what this is, that's what this is called, it's called power timing an engine. You start off by setting the engine up with a timing light to the factory spec. Now, again, see, I'm trying to explain an, an intuitive process. I'm trying to explain something that includes what my senses pick up. So to explain it is, is kind of hard, which is one of the reasons I haven't done this video yet, because it's, you're really talking about how you feel things, how you perceive things, how you sense things, and, move, and measurements that aren't precise, measurements that are, you know, what I, what I feel. So that's why I haven't done this video yet. So you start off with the timing at the initial spec. If the motor's got some serious mileage on it and that spec isn't adequate, there's a sound you'll hear from the exhaust and the only way I can describe it is it's deep and laboring. Also, 
exhaust systems, even though uh, they're, they're basically airtight, they're never really completely, totally airtight. You won't hear the exhaust leak. You won't hear it because it's very fine. And when the engine is functioning correctly, the exhaust is flowing past that leak so fast, and a tiny leak, that it doesn't look to escape. There's a flow to it. But when an engine has its timing retarded and you hear that laboring sound, you'll hear, you will hear tiny hints of an exhaust leak, like around the manifolds uh, or headers, but generally we're talking about stock engines. You'll hear it, right? Uh, and, and it's a hard sound to describe. If you have an engine that has that, that deep laboring idle and that slight, very slight, ticking kind of almost exhaust leak from the exhaust, if you advance the timing a hair, you'll hear it go away. The, the laboring will go away, that slight ticking out of the exhaust around the manifolds, that'll go away, and this thing will just, it'll, just, it'll sound right. So once you've set your initial timing, you're going to listen for that. You're going to listen for the way the engine idles, it, the tone of the idle. The next thing is throttle response. So again, let's say you've got a stock engine and you've set it at the four degrees before top dead center that the book calls for. But now you get in the car and you give it gas and it, it labors. It doesn't want to jump up and go. A lot of times you'll get like a little a stumble and it'll pop through the intake. That's telling you that that stock spec, the, the four degrees before top dead center, is not enough. It's actually in reality because of things like timing chain stretch and a little extra play at the distributed drive gear and the, the diminished dynamic compression of an older engine. It's telling you that that four degrees is actually zero or, or after top dead center. That, that. So what you want to do is, after you've set your initial timing, if you've got that where the car isn't just, doesn't just pop up when you hit the gas, you want to give the distributor just a little tweak. And again, see? It's not the kind of thing where I can, I can say, advance it two degrees or advance it four degrees or six. You can't. It's a feel. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that you just, oh, how do you even explain it? You can't explain it. It's, it's an intuitive thing. You'll know when it's right. But generally speaking, you'll go just a hair. So when I'm dealing with an older engine, whether it's mine or, or friends or customers, uh, and I go through this tuning process, what I'll do is I'll put the distributor in the car, I'll, I'll set the distributor up, get everything with the timing marks, and I'll leave the distributor clamp, the distributor hold down loose. So that this way I can, and you don't leave it loose enough that the thing's just going to flop around like that. You leave it just loose enough so that you can grab the distributor firmly, right, and give it a nudge, okay? And, and a nudge, I know, it's like, What's a nudge? Well, a nudge is one of those non-specific measurements that's part of that intuitive process that you pick up as you play along with this stuff. So you want to give the distributor just, just a nudge, right? And then try that to auto response again. Or again, you, you, we're talking about the idle quality, the sound of the quality, it's got that laboring, right? Just a nudge, right? And you'll hear that go away. Same thing, like I said, you, you're, you're off idle, you're just initial throttle response, and this is assuming your, your, your accelerator pump is working correctly. As soon as you give a gas, she wants to go. You'll feel it instantly, but you don't want to go too far. So that's setting the initial timing on it. That's setting your, your baseline timing. Now in a high performance engine, a, a drag engine, a race engine, we could care less about what the initial timing is. We're only concerned with total timing on a, a typical high performance engine it's going to be somewhere between like 32 and like 36 degrees sometimes 38 degrees total timing that's what's going to count well on a street engine you don't really care about that those numbers are actually irrelevant what you're going to look for is spark knock you're going to get your best results right at the point where you're going to get spark knock so here's how you power time an engine and again, see, this is universal. This is going to apply to any, any, any gasoline engine that the distributor is determining what the spark is going to be, what the timing is going to be. Your first thing is have the car, obviously, up to operating temperature, completely warmed up. 
you want to have everything in place. You want to have your air cleaner in place. You want to have everything as it's going to be driven. The gasoline you're going to use, you want to have the gas that you're going to typically use, what's found in your area. Whatever, whatever blend you use, you definitely don't want to use super if you don't normally use super. But whatever gas you're going to use on a regular basis, that's what you want in a car. You want to try to do this during an average day, you know, not when it's super cold or it's super hot. And you want to do this on a hill, in a hilly area because I find that the best results are, are, are from driving the car up a hill under a load. So what you do is you've established your initial timing. You first put your timing light on it, you get your four degrees, it wasn't quite right, you gave the distributor a nudge, it came up, now it's kind of smooth, right? So now you want to drive the car. In high gear, you want to, you want to find a hill, right? Or, or a, you know, a long incline, and you want to accelerate hard up at that incline. You want to listen very carefully for an audible spark knock. It, you, you're, not, you're, not even, you're not looking for rattling. Okay? If, you, if you hear rattling, you've gone too far, there's something wrong. You want to hear just the faintest spark knock. Now let's say you're driving up the hill, you got it to the wood, and you're not getting that, that spark knock. What you want to do now is you want to pull over, you want to grab your distributor and give it just a nudge in the direction of advance. Now by the way, if you're dealing with a vacuum advance distributor, the advance canister is always pointing in the direction of advance. Right? It's, it's backwards from distributor rotation. So if you're going to advance this distributor, this, this vacuum advance canister is pointing in the direction of advance. So this is where you want to pull this from. So you run up the hill, you've, you've got your foot on the floor, you give high gear, you're going up the hill, you don't hear any spark knock, you give your distributor just a nudge, just a nudge in the direction of advance. Now repeat the process. Start going back up the hill again. Still don't hear a spark knock, another nudge, right? Now you have to keep, <laughs> you have to keep track of your nudges. You have, my nudge is going to be different than your nudge. You see what I'm saying? Now I guess you could put a timing light on it, right? And check every time and advance it, let's say two degrees at a time. It's not really practical. If you do it this way, trust me, you'll get good results. You give it another nudge. Now, when you go up the hill, you start to hear the faintest spark knock, right? Just the faintest spark knock. Pull over. Now, go back a nudge, right? And if you're using a timing light, let's say two degrees, go back like two degrees. Run it up the hill again. That's, if you don't hear a spark knock, you know you have found the, the maximum, or I should say, the optimum ignition timing for that engine in its current condition, in its current state, that's your optimum overall ignition timing. Generally speaking, I would say on an engine that's got, let's say, 150, 200,000 miles on it, it's got like an old timing set in it, it's got the typical wear and slop through the valve train and whatnot, I would say on an engine that, had, that, that calls for four degrees before, six degrees before top dead center, that you're going to find it actually closer to like 14 to 16 degrees before top dead center, where you'll find that optimum ignition timing, that, that spark knock, that power timing. Like I said, it's a, it's a non, it's, it's, oh God, it's the least precision way to tune an engine. But when you're talking about something that's got an unknown history, it's got, I mean, ridiculous miles on it, it's, 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 it's old, it's sloppy, it's worn in, this really is the best possible way to give it that tune-up. It's all intuitive and it all takes practice. And, I mean, it, you, but they all work the same. It could be a Slant 6, it could be a 454 Chevy and your tow rig, it could be anything. They all respond exactly the same way. And again, now we're not talking about a hot rod motor. We're not talking about something that's fresh, there's a high compression, good timing gears, and everything is fresh and good. Don't time it this way. Do not time it this way. This is for the vintage car, the classic car, the older thing, the, the distributor driven 1971 Chevy that hasn't been apart since Nixon was, was in the White House. That's what this applies to. Get out there and practice. I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.